I am here tonight for Bible study. Yay! Let me share with you, uh, I was enjoying myself. Um, this is not the first time you tuned into our Bible study. When you are a pastor of a church that has a lot of good Bible study teachers, you can get you a rest and a break every now and then because I know the quality of what you will get here at Shiloh is going to be the quality of someone who has put the time in to study. That, that's very important. And they put the time in to study to make sure you can understand. Uh, let me tell you how long it's been since I've been here. Wow. We've been doing these three, uh, three and four week series, which have been a blessing to all of us. Uh, because the Word of God is that deep that you, you have to give yourself time to get into it. So I had my assistant pastor, Pastor Brown. He did a great study, you know, I, and I get a chance to listen uh, to all of this. You guys got to tune in and see. Then we had Pastor Gary Mack. He did a great study. And how about the round table of our women and the book of Ruth? Amen. Such a blessing that, that I, I got so many comments. I was just getting spoiled. You know, just listening to Bible study. And so we all try to prepare in advance. So I, I did have this word prepared, and I'm, I'm excited about teaching. I think it's going to bless you tonight. Let's get right into the word of God. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you tonight for your presence already here. I take nothing for granted when it comes to your blessing. I take nothing for granted when it comes to all those who have joined us tonight. Please allow your word to go and do that, what you have sent it out to do and let it accomplish that work. And we thank you, God, because it's not dependent upon us. We are, we're nothing without your help. When your help comes, everything moves. So Lord, I ask you to bless those who are listening tonight as they're gathering. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I would ask you now, if you will, uh, go to the chat, you know, put in the chat who's listening. Just list your name so we know who's on tonight. Send the link out, you know, let somebody know that we're on tonight so that the Word of God can be spread around. And I just want to thank you for joining us. But tonight we're going to teach from a thought on the healing power of laughter. The healing power of laughter. I bet everyone who is listening to me knows at least one miserable person. You know what I mean by miserable. Every time the person shows up, they're never happy. Um, the conversation they have is one that drags you down. When you see them coming, you want to go in the other direction. And it seems like it is their life's mission to make you just as miserable as they are. Nobody know I'm talking about? A miserable person. I bet you also there's all, everybody looking at me knows at least one mean person. When I say mean, I'm talking about not mean like you're afraid of them, but mean like when you're in their presence, it's almost like you got to walk on eggshells because they are so contrary to everything that's said. If you say anything, they're going to find the opposite way to talk about it. And so you know that if the conversation goes a little past what is acceptable to them, bam, they're going to reach out and get you because mean people will make you feel like you just broke that egg. And how many people know a pessimistic person? I know everybody has seen one of them. This is the person who comes to you and they are looking for why something don't, doesn't work. They're, they're pessimistic. They, they don't believe. They're, they're the kind that always look and see the glass is half empty instead of half full. Man, a pessimistic person, if that's one of your friends, I pity you because they never allow you to live your faith. Because every time you get excited about something, they want to pull you down because they're going to point to you and share you with you why it doesn't work. If you know any of these people, don't show any, don't show any sign right now. In case you're in the room with one, don't just get And also, the worst of all is the complainer. Come on. How many know I definitely don't want to live with a complainer? Because a complainer is worse than a pessimist. They're worse than a mean person. They're worse than just a, a person who walks around unhappy. This person who is 
complainers, they're never satisfied. So with a complainer, you can't do anything right. If, you, uh, if you're running late, they complain, but they don't say we're late now. They, complainers do this. We always late. If you're early, they complain about being early. Why we got to be here so early? And if you're on time, they complain about being on time. I wish we came a little earlier so we could pick our seats. If you're late, I wish we came a little later so we wouldn't have to go through the crowd. These are people who are just miserable. But I want you to do a favor for me as I start this lesson. I want you to picture now those people I just talked about. Get, them, get in your mind. Think about their faces. What, what do you see when you see the face of these people that you know and I know exist even in God's church? What do you see? You know what you see? You see a frown. You see wrinkles. You see a deadpan smile, like, don't touch me, don't talk to me. And these are the people that are so miserable, they make your life miserable. But on the other side of that, how many of us know a person who makes us feel good? I'll start with this. How many of us know a nice person? A nice person is the kind of person who, I am concerned about their niceness. It seems like people walk all over them, but they're so nice because when they come into your presence, they're always trying to find ways to help. And these nice people I'm talking about, they're well-liked. Everybody likes being around them. Uh, all of us, I hope you have at least one nice person that you know. Maybe you're that nice person. How many know an optimist? I love these. As a pastor, we live for optimists because the, the work of the church is already hard enough. But when you get somebody who comes to my study, knocks on the door and says, Pastor, it looks bad, but it's going to be all right. God's going to work it out. It does not even matter how bad it is. I know my, you look for that person when things are going wrong in your life. You look for that optimistic person. You don't want the one coming around to like, I don't know. You know, we got a whole lot of them. How you don't know when you say you're living by faith? Well, we got all of these people who come around. And the last one is a plain old happy person. It's hard to find one. This is the kind of person, but we all know one, when you see them coming, you want to be around them. They're always friendly. They're always smiling. As a matter of fact, here's what people say about these people. They, they encourage you, but they also send you into a place of laughter. Uh, they are guilty of, and these are the words we use for them, the kind of person I'm talking about. We say, and we see them coming. We all got this person. We'll say, um, yeah, she cracks me up. He cracks me up. But we say, he's so crazy. What crack me up means is every time this person around will say this person has the ability to either crack us up or they, or they start laughing so hard that they crack themselves up. These are the people we're talking about tonight because if you're in that first group, let me tell you right now, I have some scientific and spiritual and biblical evidence that you are missing out on some things in life. You're missing out on a quality of life. You're missing out on some times of exhilarating joy. You're missing out on some days when you would have some power and strength, but you don't have it because you're always down and you never want anybody else to be happy. So you're walking around missing out what God has for you. You're missing joy. You're missing strength. You're missing interaction with the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is joy. There's joy that comes down from being in touch with the Spirit. So when you see one of these people, I need you to know you're leading your life into a place of misery. But if you are one of those people who are happy, you love to laugh, everything around you, you enjoy a good time. You look for ways to make other people happy. Y'all still with me? Don't leave me because we're going to go somewhere. You, 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 are, you are looking for ways to make other people happy. I'm going to tell you what happens. People love to see you coming because they know they're not going to get hurt. They're not going to be harmed. And a matter of fact, they're going to feel better when they get out of your presence. And if you are a person who can laugh, I will tell you, the Bible is going to let us know that laughter brings us power for healing, for restoration. It actually destroys loneliness. It, dis it disintegrates fear. It gets you to a place where you can just laugh, especially if you're the kind of person that can laugh at yourself. There will be some joy that you've never seen before. If you've ever been in a room with the kind of people who always are joyful and always laugh and always have 
have fun, you know the time just flies by. It seems like the clock stops, the stress leaves, and we're in this endless moment where we're just excited about what is going on. Let me give you some Bible so you understand this. I know we approach God's word with fear. I know we approach God's word with reverence. I know we approach God's word with godly fear. I know God's word is the blueprint. It is the map that teaches us about the things that we need to make it on this side and about our eternal resting place. God's word tells us the connection between our spirit and our soul and our body and how to get victory. But God's word also talks about laughter. And God has given us the wonderful gift of laughter. And I want to say, even though God's word has all these things in it, uh, God teaches us about sin. God teaches us about sanctification. God teaches us about growth. God teaches us about faith. God teaches us about how we can become better uh, uh, friends and better uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. But the reality is, God, listen to me, gave us the ability to laugh because God likes to laugh and God has a sense of humor. How do I know God has a sense of humor? Because the Bible tells us in Genesis 1.26, write it down, it said, and God made man in his image. The Mago Dei. We are made in the image and likeness of God. So if I have a sense of humor, what makes you think God doesn't have a sense of humor? God is the one who said you're created in my likeness. I'm going to show you in these two weeks before this teaching is over, I'm going to show you the numerous passages in the scripture that shows us that laughter is something God not only accepts, God gives it to us so that we can survive and so we can make it through situations. And sometimes we don't laugh enough. And one of the problems with someone going through right now is you need to laugh again and again and again. And that's why this lesson is called the power, the healing power of laughter. A laughter, emotional, mental, spiritual, healing in our laughter. God said, I made you in my image. And if you go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, after God made us, that's why we're the only creatures that are made after God's image, it said that he took man and he blew a personal touch. He blew the breath of life in his man so that we could be, sh just, we share God's breath. We share that anointed anointing of God. And God says, with that, I have created us to laugh. Let's look at a key scripture. One we all know. Proverbs 17, 22. Proverbs 17, 22. Watch out. Watch how God says that. Somebody right now, before this class is over, I want you to learn how you can knock out some demonic forces, some dark stuff in your life by just becoming a person that flips this thing over and just understands a power, the power that's in a lab. Proverbs 17, 22. A merry heart. I don't have time to keep, you know, to exposit this thing word by word and do a word study. But a merry heart doeth good like medicine. But a broken spirit dries the bones. That's King James. Let's look at a other, couple other translations to see the, the exactness of it, uh, language exactness that God was trying to get us to see. In Proverbs 17, 22, in the New Living Translation, it says, a joyful heart is good medicine, but depression drains one's strength. Proverbs 17, 22, in the New, in God's Word, trans, in the New Living Translation. Watch this. Uh, that was the God's Word translation. A joyful heart is good medicine, but depression drains one's strength. That's the, if you're looking up these translations, that's the God's Word translation. The New Living Translation says, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps your strength. Man, you better quit walking around with your sad face. You better quit walking around talking about, I need to get another scripture. And you better learn how to be the kind of person that is enjoying your life and rejoicing in life and learning the power of laughter. This text is telling us God created laughter for a purpose. And that purpose is to be good medicine to our souls. As we laugh, when I show you the 
scientific things that happen inside our bodies, you're going to understand that not only does our physical body get set free, but our mind gets set free. Because God created our bodies and our minds to renew themselves. While you're running around being sad, if you were the kind of person that could just be the person that starts the fire of laughter, or make someone laugh, or at least enjoy it to laugh. Some people you're around, have you ever been around them? You can't say nothing because they want to be serious all the time, or they want to be silly. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the laughter that lights up God's heart and that God gave us so we could survive. If you laugh at a situation, you remove all of the uh, doubts and all of the fears that you have about it because the laughter just says, I'm confident that God can work this out. Why in the world are you laughing? Because my God got it under control. Tell somebody that. I am laughing because my God showed me he can already work it out. Why do you sit around? Somebody said, why are you always telling jokes in the pulpit or laughing around? Because the reality is a sad person can't get blessed. A person who is depressed can't let the word of God even in their heart. You can't even get the light of God work in you because you take yourself so serious and want to knock other people. I'm going astray. Let me stay where I'm at. Laughter is what God created to help us grow and to bless us. And the purpose of laughter is when we find ourselves, I don't know if anybody's there now, in a season where we are down or solemn sour, unhappy. God said a cure for that is laughter. Think about how you feel when you laugh. Is anybody out there that can attest with me tonight? I know this is not, you know, a deep subject and everybody wants to get deep, but when you put in there, man, I survived by my laughter. Somebody put that in the chat so someone can see. I'd rather be with somebody who laughs than somebody who's always down and always pulling the emotional rug from out from under me. I want to be around somebody that can be joyous. We need to learn that God has given us laughter to heal us and to help us. This woman had just gotten into town and she was looking for a church that would baptize her cat. So, she saw the first church she stopped at. It was a Baptist church. She pulled in went to the secretary's desk and said, um, I'd like to see the pastor. I have an unusual request. I want someone to baptize my cat. The secretary looked at her and said, your cat? And she said, yes. She knocked on the pastor's door. said, pastor, there's a lady out here who wants you to baptize her cat. The pastor said, tell her we don't do that. The secretary went out, told the lady, well, the pastor said, she said, well, can I see him? And just explain to him. So the secretary went back in, told the pastor, she insists on seeing you. But by this time, the pastor was a little perturbed. He got up, went out there, and said, Ma'am, I understand what you want. There is a Methodist church down the street. There's a holiness church over there, Church of God in Christ. Uh, any of those, Catholic church, any of those churches, I'm sure, would answer your request. The woman said, Oh, thank you, Pastor. Um, thank you for giving me those referrals. Said, And I'm going to make a $2,500 donation to whatever church... Uh, baptizes my cat. The pastor looked at her and said, Oh, honey, you should have told me your cat was Baptist. <laughs> okay, y'all gotta work with me on that. You gotta work with me. Or, or how about this? How about this? Uh, God created the heaven and earth and rested. Then God created man and rest. Then God created woman and nobody has gotten any rest since then. Just kidding. I'm moving on. Or, Father O'Malley, this priest, was riding down the highway, he was speeding, and he saw a cop pull up behind him, and the cop pulled over, when he pulled him over, he looked in the car and saw a wine bottle on the back floor. And he looked at the priest, looked a little tipsy, he said, have you been drinking? And the priest said, only water. And the, police officer, the priest said, only water. The priest said, what is that wine bottle I see on the back of your floor? That priest turned around and said, oh my God, Jesus done done it again. <laughs> See the power of laughter. Hey, some of y'all don't laugh. Y'all work with me on this. I'm going to have fun myself. The reality is God wants us to laugh. And for all of those, you know, who say, Pastor, get back to the scripture. I'm going to take you into 
of biblical text is an understanding to show you there are volumes of instances where it might not just say the word laughter, but the situation itself was funny. And then there's other places where some of the major Bible characters found themselves in a situation that sometimes we get so deep when we're looking at our faith, we don't understand what was really going on. Come on, go with me to the Go with me to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17. Wait till you get there. Genesis 17. Don't make me do all the work. Genesis 17. Beginning at verse 1. I need you to have the whole context of the text. We understand that uh, God had appeared to Abraham in chapter 12. All of our biblical, all of our biblical scholars, or you uh, understand, biblical readers, those who study know that God appeared and promised him, gave him a covenant, chose Abraham to be the father of his uh, chosen generation, his chosen people. Then he appeared to him in 15, renewed the covenant. Here is God in chapter 17, renewing the covenant again. But I want you to follow me. And when Abram, the name was still Abram, was 90 years old and 9, he was 99, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, now you got to understand this is a, one of the I think most solemn times in Scripture is because God was setting up the whole redemption plan through his chosen people. But look what happened. He said he talked with him saying, As for me, verse 4, Behold, my covenant is with thee. This is God talking. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Let's stop and hear that. So Abram, his name was changed by God to represent the purpose God had for him. I, I can't skip off with that, but understand that God has purpose for all of us and many miserable people. This still has to do with laughter. You're not laughing because you know you're out of God's purpose. It's when we find purpose that we find contentment. It's when we find purpose. And know this. Please get this. You were not created to do what you wanted. You were created to find your purpose. And once you find your purpose, you find the contentment and the joy to be the kind of person who can have a life that's contented enough that every now and then I can laugh. Look at that. He said, um, your, your name has been changed. Verse 6. And I will make thee, listen to the promises, exceedingly fruitful. I will make the nations of thee, and the kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for everlasting covenant, to be God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thy seed, and to the seed after that, the land wherein thou art called stranger, all the land of Canaan, for everlasting possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, And thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, Thou therefore thy seed after thee in the generation. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and the seed after thee. Every child, every man and child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised of your flesh and foreskin. And shall be a token to the covenant between me and thee. And in that, in that eight days of the old, old shall be circumcised. Eight days after they're born, they shall be circumcised. Among you, every man and child in your generation. He that is born in the house. He or brought with money, or stranger, which is in thy seed. He that is born in the house, and he that is bought with thy money, must needs be circum circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man and child whose flesh is born skin not circumcised, that our soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, verse 15, And Sarah thy wife, who is now 90, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, she, she shall be called Sarah. And I will bless thee and her, and give thee a son also of her. You, ye, I will bless her. You, you shall be blessed. She will be a mother of nation. Kings of the people shall be of her. And Abraham, oh wait a minute. So let's go back and, and recap this for a minute. God just told Abraham, 99 years old, that I'll make a covenant with you. This first time he changed his name. He said, I'm going to give you a son. He said, Sarah's going to have a child. You're going to be 99 years old, but at 99, you're going to have to get circumcised. Hello, somebody. Circumcision at 99. 
circumcision at one. Now, I don't know if they had any anesthesia back then, but he had to get circumcised at 99. Then he told him, you will have this much seed, that much seed. Abraham and Sarah are no longer in any kind of childbearing age. So God laid all this on him and said, is Sarah going to have a child? And then he thought about Sarah. I don't know. He looked in there and said, I don't think Sarah still can have a baby. But when God laid all this on him, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set it up this way. What would happen if God, if I picked out one of the oldest couples in church, brought them up front and told everybody, she get ready to have a baby. They pray. You want to do what verse 17 says in our text. We might have passed this, but don't miss it this time. Abraham did what any one of us would have did. And this was not a little thing. Verse 17 said, and Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Do you understand that? This wasn't a little laughter. Abraham heard this. He said, okay, you're 99, you're old, you're going to be circumcised, you're going to have a child, Sarah, you're going to have a child. And Abraham, oh, and the Bible says in verse 17, Abraham fell. This was, can you imagine what fall on your face mean? That means he had a hoo holler. He jumped down and said, I'm going to do what? Is what he's going to say. And the Bible said, he said it in his heart. But if God told you this, and some of you out there know what I'm talking about, you either going to get angry or you're going to laugh. And the laughter was placed in him for that moment. So I'm going to show you how God understood when he laughed. He fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Think, so the child be born unto me when I'm 100 years old. And Sarah, with her old self, 90 years old, she's going to bear a child. And look what happened. I like verse 18. That's funny too. 18, uh, Abraham said, uh, God, I, I like you showing up, you know, giving me this pleasure. But in verse 18, he said, I got an idea. Can we use Ishmael? You know, he already here. <laughs> can, can you use Ishmael? Uh, I don't know about this me having a child stuff, but let Ishmael come before you. I made him when I was a little bit younger. <laughs> Are y'all with me? What he was saying is, this was a funny situation, even though it was a faithful situation. Sometimes we don't understand. God understands our laughter. And the laughter was something, I believe, that helped him get over and increase his faith because he understood, and God understood. Let's keep reading. It said, and God said, Sarah, God reiterated, verse 19, shall bear thee a son indeed. Thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant through Isaac. And he kept talking about Isaac. In verse 22, it says, and God left off talking to Abraham. Whoop, what would you have done? I don't know about you. I'd have ran right to somebody who I trust and said, man, here you ought to hear what God said to me. And I would have been laughing. He said, me and Sarah, we can't even walk. We get ready to have a baby now. And we're going to have, we're going to be the father of all the nations of God. Come on. But God still used Abraham. And I believe that this portion of laughter goes back to us being created in God's image. God understood that laughter did not mean we were not believing in faith. It was a reaction to our humanity. And the laughter at that time probably helped him understand how to move forward. That's not even the funniest one. Go to Genesis 18 with me. Go to Genesis 18. Let's see what old Sarah said when God told her. We just saw what Abraham did. Let's see what Sarah said when God told her. So in chapter 18, as we're aware, the biblical context is uh, they're getting ready to go. God is sending the angels to see about Sodom and Gomorrah. Or God is going to Sodom and Gomorrah. So if you're at Genesis 18, let's begin reading at the first verse. It says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. Now understand, in our Bibles, we have chapters and verses. But as we know, that was not so until they put the Bible together, right? So when you look at this, it's talking about the Lord who had just appeared to him, and that's where God appeared to him. But we're going into another chapter for us, but it's just a continuation of a conversation. Now look what happened. Then it tells us, and he lifted up his eyes, and looked. this is Abraham, and lo, three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them in the tent door, and bowed himself for him, and said, my Lord. Now we believe, biblically, theologically, let's get a little Bible in here, that the this was actually the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ, in incarnation. 
And the reason we believe this was Jesus in incarnation is because the Bible tells us in John 1.18 that no man has ever seen God at any time. So this would preclude uh, uh, him from seeing God the Father. And we can continue that thought in 1 Timothy 6 and 16. It says, no man has ever seen God in the person of the Father. So John 1.18, write that down, 1 Timothy 6.16, tells us that this must have been Jesus Christ. And we're going to find out how, because of the language of the text, him telling him that he's going to revisit him. Only God could do that. An angel could not do what's next in the text. Let's read it. And he said, my Lord, verse 3. If now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet, and the rest and the rest yourselves under the tree, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch some mortal morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after I'm reading King James, guys. I was, I was gonna do the ASB, but I'm gonna keep it the King James. Uh, it still be the job. After that year shall pass, still in verse 5, it says. For therefore are ye come to your servant, and they said, So do as thou hast said. In verse 6, And Abraham hastened to the tent of Sarah and said, Make ready, quick three measures, uh, fine meal, knead it, make cakes of the heart. And Abraham ran to the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man and hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk, and we'll, we'll move on down. But the verse we want to get to is verse 9. Now, this is how we know it was God, because in verse 9 he said, they said, and where is Sarah, thy wife? Remember, God had just made the promise to Abraham. Now, here's these three angels on their way to do God's judgment in Sodom and Gomorrah. And while in the middle of feeding them, they asked the question, where is your wife? Look what God said. And he said, in the tent. And in verse 10, he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it. Y'all with me? <laughs> in verse 10. And Sarah heard it in her tent door, which was behind them. Sarah was behind the tent. Yeah, I guess Abraham hadn't had a chance to tell her yet. But she heard them say, you're going to have a child. And the Bible says, when she heard it, now Abraham and Sarah were old, well stricken in age, and had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Stop. This Bible is saying very clearly, that they physically could no longer have relations. They had ceased from laying down, having uh, normal sexual relations, meaning that they were not able. And that's what Sarah started thinking about. How am I going to have a child when me and Abraham can't even, you know, do that? Think about it. That's what she said. In that verse, she said, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. Therefore, in verse 12, what will come out of your mouth? Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I'm this old, shall I again have pleasure, my Lord, being so old? She was saying, we have not slept together. We have not been able. We're, we're old. In the normal uh, uh, course of aging, that function no longer works with us. And you going to let me have a baby? Sarah laughed. And the Bible said, God said, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I, when I am old? Is there anything too hard for God? This is God reaffirming, reaffirming her. And look what happened. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then verse 15, Sarah said, I didn't laugh. Let's get back to the Bible to touch it tonight. The healing power of laughter. Sarah laughed as any one of you would do if you knew that it was impossible in the natural. It was impossible even God had appeared to Abraham before. And coming now and saying, I'm going to have a child. Sarah said, this is not happening. But that's not the point I want you to see. The blessing is, and this is the blessing to me. God allowed that laughter to not disturb his promise. You can laugh. I'm not saying be disrespectful, but when your laughter is one of, I don't know how this is going to happen, and you're just laughing out of a natural understanding, and don't lose your faith, there's nothing wrong with having a laugh. And God is saying there's a healing power, emotionally, mentally, and in this case, it helped both of them to be able to understand 
and receive the impossible. Oh, I just said something. When you are laughing, you're not denying, you're not just doubting, you're saying, this is funny, but my God can do it. Anybody ever been there? God said that laughter is not one of disrespect. It's a laughter that's saying, I need to make it through this moment. Somebody write that down. Some of you right now would make it through some other moments if you would just learn how to laugh. And don't be critical of people who laugh. I love to be, I mean, tell, tell, tell you a story. When I was growing up, I don't know if you had parents like I did, but in our household, whenever it was thundering and lightning, that was God's work. So my, my, I came out of a Christian household where when the lightning and thunder started, don't laugh. I know there's some old school people out there just like me. We turned all the lights out of my house. And we had to sit in the dark. Now, what do you think? My dad's sitting over there. He, he humming and moaning, you know, the old Christmas song. A child to keep. So we over there. My, my brother starts, then I start saying, don't touch me, don't hit me. And we get a case of the giggles. I don't know about you, but you ever start laughing and couldn't stop? And, it was, and you were trying to stop. My, my father was walking over to get us, and we were still laughing. We were saying, oh, it's not me, it's Dennis, it's not. And we were just caught up in laughter. And I know, and I know to this fact, the only reason I'm bringing this in is because I know God did not hold it to charge, so I could not do the purpose that I'm doing right now. I have been carrying this word. Yeah, I was a silly little child like everybody else. But God is not so insecure. God is not so stupid that he don't understand. Laughter is something he made inside of us. And the laughter helps us and bless us. And I remember many, many times, we got a couple smacks, we didn't get a full-on beating. But when laughter comes in like that, it is something so uncontrollable and it cleanses and bless you. Can I show you one more text? Before I, before I give you some scientific evidence, go with me to 1 Kings 19. Go to 1 Kings 19. This is a blessing. 1 Kings. Uh, you want to go to 19 or... 18. Let's see. Let's go to 1 Kings because this is something that God just shared with me. Go to 1 Kings. And let's start at verse 17. Let's see. No, 17 is when he came. So you go to verse 18. 1 Kings. That's cool. Right there. Alright, so you know 1 Kings 18, right? I don't have to set this up. And it came to pass, verse 1 of 1 Kings 18. At many days after the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elisha went and showed himself to Ahab. Remember, in chapter 17, he had just said that there, there, there would be a drought for three years. And now it says it was time for him to go tell Ahab that it wouldn't be. So we go through and we find out that in verse eight, in chapter 18, that uh, Ahab sent Obadiah, one of his trusted servants, and he went out. And as he was going, he found Elisha after Ahab was trying to find Elisha all those times. And he told Allah, he told Obadiah, Obadiah, go tell the king I'm going to show myself. And Obadiah said, look, don't fool me. Every time, when I leave, you're going to disappear and then I'm going to die in front of the king. He said, please don't do that. And he said, no, I'm really going to show myself. So he got before Ahab and he told Ahab, Ahab said, are you the one been troubling Israel? And then he got before Ahab and Ahab said, unto, and he said, not me, you troubled God's people. And then, this had to be God. If you look at the text, it says that Ahab, let's go to verse, I think it's around verse 18. Let's look at it. Yeah. He answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Baal. Now therefore, send and gather to me all of Israel on Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. You know what he just said? This is how God moves. He actually, Elisha showed up and commanded King Ahab to go out and bring the prophets of Baal. You remember the prophets of Baal were Jezebel's prophets. Jezebel was a Phoenician princess that uh, Ahab had married that had bought the, the actual following of Asterisk and Baal into the groves of God into Israel. She was the one turning the hearts of Israel toward foreign gods. So she was away, apparently, and when, they, and when the prophets heard that Ahab called them, they wanted to be in favor of Ahab, but they were sure mad at Elisha, because Elisha had made them look silly. 
Because with all that they had, they couldn't make the rain come after God spoke to one man that it wasn't going to rain. I don't have time to get on this Holy Spirit. Quit messing with me. But you need to realize there's only one true God. And anything else you have harboring in your spirit that's stopping you from serving him is going to be a disaster. And they're really not God. Are you with me? So he called all the people in uh, Mount Carmel. And you know the story. When he got them all together, there were 450 prophets of Baal. And there was just one Elisha, the prophet of God. That was enough. Because me and God and you and God together are more than the whole world against us. And so here he was, and he said, let's have a contest. Let's look down at the text. When he got the more, he said, uh, let's have a contest. Since I'm the only one that remained, he said, let's get, I'll start at verse 23. Uh, let them therefore give us two bullocks. Let them choose one bullock for themselves. I'm in mean, 1 Kings 18, 23. For themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. Put no fire under it, and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on the wood and put no fire under it. And call you the name of your God, and I will call the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let all the people answer and say, it is well spoken. And Elisha told the prophets of Baal, you can go first. Verse 26, they took the bullock which was given them and dressed it and called on the name of Baal. Now here's where it starts getting funny. Can you imagine? All these 400 prophets, they could start, they, they dealt, they made an altar, put the bullocks on the altar, and then they started marching around calling on Baal. Baal! Oh, Baal! Oh, Baal! They did this from morning till noon. Look at the text. So that means for at least four or five hours, they were just calling. All the people looking, all of a sudden, this struck a funny chord in Elisha. And Elisha said, and this is the funny thing, he said, hey y'all, verse 27, look at it. Elisha cried and said, uh, call a little louder. Uh, maybe you got sleep. He can't hear you. Is he also somewhere talking? What he said is, maybe you guys on vacation. He says, I can imagine as he was mocking them, he was cracking up. Call you guys a little louder. He sure ain't answering and just fall down. And I bet you there was people out there in the audience. When I say the audience, all the people of Israel were standing around. He was just cracking everybody up. Laughter was the blessing of that moment. And I know it cut them to the core because it said they took knives and they started cutting themselves and said it was past noonday and they just wore themselves out by the evening. And then he told them, they had, they, the Bible said they didn't have any more voice. I bet you Elisha had fun with that whole scene. And then the Bible says that Elisha called on God, set up the bullets, and he said, pour water on the altar. Think about how sarcastic that is. Pour water on the altar again. Think about what he was doing to show them up. Pour water on the altar again. You know, and maybe on the side he said, now watch my God answer one time. And he stood up, the Bible said, and said, oh Lord my God, I know you hear God of Abraham, I, I know you're going to hear me. And the Bible said when he prayed, fire came down and consumed the entire altar. And all the people rejoiced and said, God is God. And he said, now kill the prophets of Baal. Laughter was a part of another scene where God was able to get someone from following or in a dollar, a dollar situation, a dollar situation, situation that was happening, he was able to stop that idolatry by laughter. It was, now here's what I call it. I believe when he started laughing, look at the text, laughter was his strength because it gave him enough strength to do what he did. Because we have to transpose this scene of him dancing around and mocking with chapter 19. Go to chapter 19 with me of Elijah, of, of, of 1 Kings. Now, he was laughing. All of us have the propensity, listen to me, stay with me, for being emotional. We have emotional highs and lows. All of us have to fight off. You know, I, I look at people who act like there is this line drawn somewhere so cer certain of us who are serving the Lord with all our might, we don't ever have it as bad as they have it. That is a lie. 
You don't know the nightmares other folk have to live through. You don't know the times in the midnight hour when I had to get up and pray and anoint myself. I'm, yeah, just so I could make it to another day. Have I got a witness here? You don't know the middle of the day when your brain crashes down and you're in a spiritual battle and you don't know how you're going to make it to the next moment and you somehow hold on to God. I need a witness out there. And when you turn back around, God has not only set you free, he delivered you to go through again. He never told you it was going to be easy. He just told you you had to fight. It's not the fact that you have to fight and fall. It's not the fight that you have to worry about. It's not how hard the fight is you have to worry about. The question is, can you take a punch and get back up again and keep doing what God asked you to do? And I believe the laughter in this emotional man made him able to stand in a scene he could not because his heart was open for the power of God. How do I know that's true? Look at verse 19. Chapter 19, verse 1. Nothing has changed. All the prophets are dead. Jezebel is coming back. The Bible said, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elisha had done, slain all the prophets with the sword. Look, one message took his strength. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elisha, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy light as the light of one of them, by tomorrow about this time. She got, he got a 24 hour threat from the enemy. We look at a 24 hour threat from the enemy. But somebody need to write in the chat. I have been walking along doing fine. Minding my own business. Then all of a sudden I was assaulted with some thoughts that told me I wasn't going to make it the next hour. I was sent for a day. How many people know that's true? 24 hours. The devil just jumped up and scared him enough. That Elisha ran 80 miles before he stopped. Look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Look at the difference between laughter and depression. Why, was it, why did he use his weapon of laughter? It says, but he himself, when a day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under the juniper tree and requested that he might die. Oh Lord, I had enough. Take my life. For I know better than my father's. And as he lay there, you know, God, of course, showed up and blessed him. The difference is you can choose to laugh or you can choose to give in. This same Elisha, in this period of time, the laughter was medicine, was strength, was blessing, was power. But then when he ran and allowed fear to come in, he was depressed. How many of you sitting out there, how many of us have allowed a thought to send us into depression when we need to know the power of mustering up? A belly laugh, mustering up some strength so that we can make it through our situation. So we need to understand laughter. Now I'm going to go through a couple things real, real quick to show you what laughter actually does on us physically. So you can see that that is biblical. But I want you to look at when I read Proverbs 17:22. Uh, a cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's saps a person's strength. We understand that. Our body, our physical body, if our flesh is not under control, come on, stay with me, then our, the enemy can come in to our soulish realm, our mind, our emotions, our thought, and allow that mind to depress our flesh, and that flesh can pull us down into areas of illness. You can talk to any doctor and you will find out that most illnesses are actually advanced by the mental attitude, attitude of the person who's going through the illness. Come on, you know that's right. If you're the kind of person who can go through contented with some joy and rejoicing, and what I say is a person who laughs is a person who opens their heart up for God to speak to them at the most detrimental moment and say, if you can just hold on to me, if you can just hold on to some joy, how many know that must be what Nehemiah felt when Nehemiah was in the middle of everybody laughing at him saying, you can't build a wall. Nehemiah said in uh, Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. What is joy? The laughter. The joy of God is what allows me to get through this situation. I'm speaking to somebody's heart right now. Don't you dare let a depressing thought steal your joy. Don't you dare let somebody around you act like you can't be funny. You can't have a joyous life. That you can't laugh. Sing yourself jokes. Read something funny. Watch what happens to your body. Let me give you this before I run out of time. We found out that physical healing 
happens with that. This is a scientific uh, understanding of what happens to our body when we laugh. Write this down. Laughter relaxes the whole body. A good hearty laugh relieves physical tension, stress, and leaves your, listen to this, leaves your muscles relaxed for 45 minutes. Laughter, here's another one, boosts your immune system. Last, laughter decreases stress hormones, increases immune cells, and infection-fighting antibodies, thus improving your resistance to, res to disease. That's why people who are mean, miserable, and don't want to laugh find themselves trying to lean on scientific knowledge when you would just use the body fighting uh, uh, remedies that God has placed in us, the tools he has given us to heal ourselves. And one of those tools is laughter instead of being sorry. It will help your immune system. Laughter, listen to this, triggers the release of endorphins. The body's natural feel-good chemicals, they are released whenever we laugh. Here's the part somebody's waiting to hear and relieves your pain. Laughter relieves pain. Laughter protects your heart. Listen to this. Laughter improves the function of the blood vessels, increases blood flow, which can help protect you against a heart attack and other cardiovascular problems. Laughter, somebody might like this one, burns calories. Okay, so it's not a replacement for going to the gym, but a study found that laughing 10 to 15 minutes a day can burn 40 calories, which can be enough over the course of a few months to lose two or three pounds. Laughter link lightens anger's heavy load on our physical body. Nothing diffuses anger and conflict faster than a shared laugh. Try it. If you've been in the middle of an argument with your spouse, and I know those listening to me, all you holy people don't argue with your spouse. I cannot be numbered among those, but both we've been together so long. Every now and then we'll bust out laughing because what we're arguing about is so silly. And that laughter diffuses the situation. Here's one you need to know. Laughter may even help you live longer. A study in Norway found that people with a strong sense of humor outlive those who don't laugh much, particularly those who are battling cancer. I'm going to close with this story. You may know it. Norman Cousins, true story of all this in action. Well, next week, I'm going to show you in the Bible, even though the Bible doesn't say Jesus laughed, like it said Jesus wept, I'm going to show you some scenes that will have you falling out that Jesus had a very, very advanced sense of humor. And there's going to be some funny things when you find out that Jesus even laughed. But here's what Norman Cousins did. And you need to understand, I don't know if you know it or not, but Norman Cousins uh, was the editor of the Saturday Review for over 30 years and was the author of a number of books, including Anatomy of Illness. You can find that book. I've read it, which covers his, I didn't read all of it. It's kind of boring, but there's some excellent parts in there. Cancer, Laughter, Cure. Here's what happened to him. In 1964, he was returning back from Moscow, Russia, and found himself, found himself down, he was hurting, and he was diagnosed with something called ankylosing spondylitis. It is a, a collagen or a bone disease, and it attacks the connective tissues of your body. And his doctor told him that people who have this disease usually don't recover. And his wife had gone with him. He noticed his wife did not have it. Being an editor at the, at the Saturday Review, he was able to start researching. He had heard some things about how stress affects the body. So he was checked into the hospital, wasn't getting any better. He was doing all kinds of stuff. He checked himself out of the hospital, went to a hotel, rented some Marx Brothers, Abbott and Costello, uh, candid camera reruns, and watched them over and over. He found out that looking, laughing for two hours gave him a full night of relief from pain. Here, here's the first thing he said. Ten minutes of laughter gave him two hours drug-free, pain-free. He was just laughing ten straight minutes, so he pushed it on, he pushed it on. Although the physician didn't endorse it, he took massive dose of vitamin C, and then the Bible says, that, I mean, then when he took the vitamin C for his immune system, the treatment proved to be so effective that in a little while, he was off all painkillers and all sleeping pills. He found that laughter relieved his pain and he would go to sleep. He wrote this book, Anatomy of Illness, in 1989. 
It was finally acknowledged in the Journal uh, of American Medical Association, watch this, that laughter therapy can help chronic illness. One of the greatest things he said that relies on the Bible, when I started saying the Bible says we run out of time, but you need to hear this. He said the quality of life, here is how we understand the quality of our life in God. Realize that each human has a built-in capacity for recuperation and repair. All he's saying is the medicines that God has helped the doctors develop, everything we take, that is not what heals our body. They aid in the healing of a body God already made to heal. You know, the very simple fact is if you cut yourself, the medicine helps us not get infected, but the body does the healing, does the healing if you can keep the infection out. Each person carries an inner doctor inside of them. The main trouble with despair is a self-fulfilling fear for people who are always down and never see the future. Their spirit gets defeated and they lose their capacity to get better. The growth of your human mind is still the best adventure and the best weapon against you being sick. Hope heals you and delivers you. I, I thank God right now. That I hope you get this, that this is about laughter, it's about understanding, um, you know, how laughter works. It's about understanding that God wants us to laugh so that we can be and do what God said to us. I'm going to close out with this one. After his little brother was baptized, they got into the car, the family, and they noticed that he was crying all the way home in the car. So his older brother looked up and said, hey, he's crying back here. What's going on? And his dad pulled up and said, what's the matter? He said, the doctor, the preacher said that after I got baptized, that I got to stay with a good Christian family, but I want to stay with y'all. <laughs> so, just laugh with me. I'll see you next week. You don't want to miss this. I'm going to teach you, we'll go into the scripture so I can show you how Jesus laughed, how God laughed, and how laughter is a weapon against whatever is attacking you. God bless you, this is Pastor Douglas. Have a great night.